So today we're going to talk about our uh, page object library. We call it Bumblebee. Uh, next. If we can figure out how to switch slides, we will continue. All right. Uh, Artem here did a presentation earlier about some of the shortcomings of page objects, and we agree with most of those shortcomings. In fact, all of them and also more. So page objects, they're not very componentized. When you have a page that has a lot of similarities with another page, sometimes it's hard to uh, reuse that code. So it definitely helps to break your page objects into smaller blocks. Page objects have a flat structure, whereas your actual UI is more of a tree structure. Uh, another problem is that page objects generally have a pattern where you perform an action and that returns a page object of the resulting type. For example, if you were to have a buy button, clicking that button brings you to some sort of credit card page where you sort out your details. It'll return you a new page object that has all of the actions for that new credit card page so that you can keep chaining your actions together. The problem is that Websites these days are so dynamic that doing an action could lead to multiple different areas. For example, what if that client has an account and if they have a certain amount of money on their account, it goes to a different page? Then what page object do you return? So it has a shortcoming there in that it's less dynamic than the website itself. And that uh, goes along with must create a method per action. Each uh, method that you create needs to return an pro uh, appropriate page object but sometimes it changes given the situation. Another problem with creating a method per page action is uh, sometimes you want to go outside the box. Instead of like say just logging in, you would want to maybe hit the login button first and then type in the password and then the username and then the password again. You know, you probably wouldn't want to do that for a login form, but you can imagine some very complicated website where doing things in a very specific order can reproduce a bug, and then you want to preserve that for aggression purposes. And so if you have a uh, very specific method on a page that's like book appointment or buy retail item or something like that, it really hides those uh, additional actions that you can take on that page. And lastly, not every company has the luxury of designing the pages themselves uh, with testing in mind. Our product uh, was uh, developed for a number of years before there was any automation at all. And so you don't usually, uh, or you don't always have that luxury. So you have to be able to handle very dynamic cases. Next. So our solutions are to break the pages into blocks and also organize them according to universal UI interfaces. Uh, universal, what I mean by that is something like a text field. You know, something like that is pretty universal. You can read text from it, you can enter text into it. So nothing too complicated. So the word universal, don't get too worried about it. It's just things like, can you click it? Uh, enumerate blocks arbitrarily. That is when, um, for example, say you have a block of uh, content on your page and then that block is repeated over and over. For example, say you have, uh, we're gonna show some examples using Reddit later. So each uh, post on Reddit has like a title, has an author, what subreddit it comes from, a link to the comments section, but that's repeated maybe 25 times on the page. It would be nice to be able to interact with all of those, but only using one method of your page object. That would be a huge win. And so we'll show you how to do that. And also you can uh, filter based on uh, those properties. Separate concerns. Uh, in our case, in our company, uh, we have a lot of testers who have serious domain knowledge over the, uh, the product itself. And then we also have a uh, sort of army of testers who know Selenium very well. But they, uh, there's not necessarily a huge overlap between the two. So it helps to be able to separate making of the making of the page objects to the people who know Selenium in such a way that uh, developing tests using those page objects is so easy that even uh, people without a huge amount of Selenium or programming experience can make automations. Oh, uh, and changing the return type from a test case that handles the uh, clicking of the buy button going to two different locations. Uh, you can have it by default return you one page object, but in very specific circumstances 
on the test case side of things, so this would be the person with extreme domain knowledge over the website being tested, they can specify, actually, I expect this to go to this other page, so return me one of those page objects instead. So here's an example of those blocks. Uh, here's uh, the home page of Reddit. You can see, well, hopefully you can see up at the top there, it's got a list of subreddits that you can go to. Now, making a page object for this page, I mean, there are hundreds of links just even in this very small uh, portion of the screenshot. But um, I would like to be able to test, or to be able to click on all of the links at the top. I'd like to be able to interact with any of the uh, posts that are uh, displayed on this page or any of the other pages. I also highlighted the login area there because uh, being able to divide your page into multiple blocks uh, is beneficial because for things like this login area, you don't necessarily want uh, you know, your username, password, and login, all of those fields exposed at the entire page level because then the entire page object becomes this giant soup of all of the elements on the page. So it's better to encapsulate those uh, little pieces into other blocks. That way, also, if there was a different page in the software that used a very similar login field, you could reuse that block. Now, yeah, can you bring up the code? So I'm going to show you how I modeled that. So uh, here's a page object. Change what? Database. So this is. Uh, the entire page object, and it does all of the things that I just described. You can interact with any of the top links. That's these featured subreddits. You can interact with, uh, sorry. This is not my machine. I'm not used to it. Uh, is that easy enough for you guys to see? Sorry. So here's all of the posts. So each post has its own object. That's one block. And we're returning a giant, oh, sorry. as you can see, we're a .NET shop over there. So this is .NET code, uh, C-sharp. Uh, so we get all of the elements just using your normal Selenium stuff. And we're going to turn those into post objects and expose them to the tester. Similarly, down here, we can uh, return a whole bunch of clickable objects, one for each of those featured subreddits. Now, how you use it is what is actually exciting. So here, I'll start with this one. We go to the, um, we go to the site in our setup, and this is the page object that we currently have. So uh, if I were to do dot, we can see we have uh, some functions, like here's our login area. We also have uh, our posts right here. And, uh, bunch of other stuff. Uh, so what we can do is we can take those featured subreddits. That's essentially a list of all of those links at the top. Here, uh, I'm doing something that would normally be kind of hard to do. I'm saying, out of the first five of those links, take a random one and click it. And then that will return to us a, uh, shoot, a Reddit page. So this uh, generic type right here is what page gets returned to after interacting with that element. So if you have a, uh, so each, sorry, each of those subreddit pages at the top, when you click it, that will go to a Reddit page. So we want a Reddit page object after clicking it. So that's what this signifies here. And thus, that will be the return type uh, here. It returns a Reddit page. After that, this line is, uh, sorry, this isn't a very real, realistic test, but just for fun, I'm printing out all of the titles of all of the posts on the page. And this is all just using that small page object we made. And then I'm verifying that the rank on the first page is one. Then I'm clicking next to go to the next page and verifying that the very first rank is 26, because there's 25 on the first page. So that's a pretty expressive test case, and it's pretty readable. I'm pretty sure a lot of people here could have described to me what this test case does just by looking at the code, if you know C Sharp, maybe. <laughs> but uh, you can pretty easily mess with these. So this is using this first method. It's just using uh, Link, which is a C Sharp library, to operate on posts. 
So we could easily change this to make sure the last page has a rank of 25. No problem. Up here, we have some more intense verifications. For example, uh, verify that there is at least one today I learned on the front page. That's a subreddit. So um, we verify using lambda expressions. And if that uh, lambda expression you know, comes out true, then it passes. So uh, whatever page was given to us here, so you can see this method returns a logged out page. That is what's given to us to operate on with our lambda expression. So we take that page, we look at the posts, and we say, for, en for any of those posts, does this lambda expression evaluate to true? And so we're saying, for a, for a given post, make sure it's subreddit's text is today I learned. And if that comes out to true, then the verification passes. So that one line of code looks at all of the posts on the page, and it says, for any of them, is this condition true? And so it's a perfectly uh, uh, free verification, because you can use lambda expressions. You don't need special methods to do matching. Uh, here, we're doing something very similar. Make sure there are no Selenium subreddit posts on the front page. Ideally, this would fail, but I'm pretty sure it's going to pass. So we just say, for all posts, make sure the subreddit text is not Selenium. And we could do other cool stuff. What was one I was going to do? We could verify that there are that no one authors on the front page twice. So I'll just write one real quick. So verify. So um, we have a Lambda expression operating on our logged out page. So let's say page, page.posts. And so since it's all strongly typed, you can write most of these methods just by using IntelliSense. Uh, we want to say posts dot, I'm going to transform this list of posts into a list of author, of strings representing the authors. So I'll say select post, turn that into post dot author dot text. So now I have a list of all of the author link texts on that page. And I can say distinct dot count equals 25. So now I'm making sure, oops, what's going on? Oh, <laughs> rookie. All right. So now I'm uh, verifying that there are exactly 25 distinct authors of posts on the front page. And that was an easy one-liner. Pretty cool. Well, easy one-liner if you're very comfortable with Lambda expressions and you know how all this works. But as you can see, you can just like infinitely chain things together. Uh, so all of these test cases, uh, you can at any time just go back to whatever you were doing, and it just gives you whatever object your test is currently operating on. The best part about all of this is that it doesn't have any dependence on the underlying uh, web elements. They're all act acting on, you know, an I enumerable, a I clickable. They're all interfaces that can be swapped out interchangeably. So uh, the Bumblebee provides some uh, standard implementations for uh, standard clickables and links and all, uh, select boxes and stuff like that. But uh, you can easily swap it out with uh, other UI libraries or even uh, native apps. So uh, Johnny here is going to show you how it works with iOS. Good? There we go. So as we were saying before, we did run into a bit more problems beyond the page object problems that we covered previously and that was covered previously um, at a different talk. Um, and that's with, uh, if we go back to Francois's discussion on iOS driver, that the JSON wire protocol really describes a set of interactions that you can really, uh, you can port across any user interface. Um, 
And having pure HTML qualifiers restricts us from doing that. Um, and Bumblebee sort of sets us up for a catalyst of something that's very future-proof. Um, we can really build off of the existing interfaces and implement them across multiple platforms. Um, and if we were restricted to pure HTML qualifiers um, within a page object, then implementing, um, implementing these, uh, these types across different platforms can get very messy very fast, and you might have to end up um, writing special implementations, um, writing, writing hacks all over your page object, just, try, just trying to get a clean page object framework um, working on a different platform. So the solution to this is the extensibility that Bumblebee offers. Um, with Bumblebee component interfacing, um, we're allowed to write tests seamlessly across all platforms, which so far I have um, iOS implemented currently, um, about to implement Android very soon, uh, wrapping Solendroid. Um, and the, the abstract to concrete paradigm is something that we've been, we've decided to take on um, as a way of allowing this framework to be constantly implemented by extensions rather than the framework itself. So Bumblebee itself offers you core implementation for browser software, for, for you know, anything you're going to run in Firefox or Chrome or Safari. Um, but having this abstract to concrete um, uh, design paradigm, you're allowed to implement these interfaces however you please. Um, what's really cool about these interfaces is that they describe a set of tools that are a set of interactions that really you're dealing with on any, any user interface. Um, I mean, on iOS, we have iSelect boxes that can represent pickers, for example. We have multiple different picker implementations. Um, for um, certain clickables, we also have swipe events. We can, um, we can inherit the existing clickable implementation and add some swipe events to it. Um, so within my framework extension to Bumblebee, Bumblebee iOS, um, we have platform-specific implementations of these user interfaces, um, as well as platform-specific extension methods that allow you to access um, core functionality of the device, such as setting location, um, setting, uh, setting user orientation, locking the phone, et cetera. Um, and this allows you to test for the specific, um, specific problems that you won't, you typically have to write hacks for um, if you were to implement, say, iOS driver using core Selenium. Um, it's going to take I mean, five lines to, you're going to have to execute script, write, write raw UI automation. Um, things just get haywire from there. So we've abstracted it all into um, very clean library, so we keep the dots moving, as we say. Um, and as you saw, that, those tests that Patrick was showing us are all one line. They're literally one line tests. Um, and that's because every time you press the dot, you're presented with the next page object that you're going to interact with. If you're interacting with a text view, then whatever you do to that text view, typically you're going to be given back the same page object. So as long as we keep the dots moving, our tests pretty much look exactly the same. You can, you can put an iOS test right next to a browser test, and in many cases, you won't be able to even tell the difference. Um, and then this also brings us to the ability, um, the ability to implement new test strategies that have emerged over time. Um, and one of the recent ones is monkey testing. Um, this is a new idea that Google has brought into perspective of um, testing st app stability, using, uh, using automation to test uh, resume state, for example. Um, if you were to lock the phone and go back into your app, are you still on the pa same page object? Is that a security issue, or um, is that a bug? So now I can show you an example implementation of this. Um, So, our, and the reason we chose Reddit, by the way, was um, they have open source uh, application that we can develop on. So, 
Um, we can use that as our test catalyst. So for example, here we have our basic test suite. Um, and we always start with this session.current block. That's basically our starting page object. I mean, when you open up the app, where are you going to be? And from there, we can start chaining the, um, the methods together, the properties together. Um, so for example, we have this test that will inevitably fail, which I wrote these um, very recently. So, um, so this is just uh, a example concept. Um, so I have a set, we both wrote libraries representing each page. And um, as you can see, it looks like it could easily be a browser test. If this was a, if this was a web application and we had a set of tabs and one of them was setting tabs and um, we clicked that setting tab, then we're, in, then we're introduced with a login block, for example. Um, it makes it very easy to read and understand your tests and why they're breaking. Um, and with the extension methods that we throw into these, um, throw into these blocks, uh, into Bumblebee itself, you're allowed to, um, you're allowed to do all sorts of verification in between these chains and uh, possibly even debug methods like inline breakpoints. And um, so you never really have to break the, um, there's very rare cases where you have to break the dots apart. Um, and if we were to run this, actually I have to set up my grid node here real quick. So it's gonna fail. Try it one more time. Come on. Oh, I have to close out the library, uh, the current simulator, my bad. Um, let's do this one more time. Now let's run it. So. Go to the settings page, enter username, bad login, not a real login, and we get a failure. That should fail because we have even a, uh, we can, make our verification verbose enough to explain why the failure happened based on the method that we're creating. But um, what I really wanted to get to was to bump to uh, iOS specific. Um, for example, here we have a, um, a test where we interact with, um, we interact with a swipe. Um, in order to delete a couple posts. It's just how it works in the Reddit app. Um, here we do declare a variable at the very beginning. Um, the, this, is, this represents the number of posts. Um, so we start at the front view. We use the store extension method. Um, we have a number of extension methods that are all covered in the Bumblebee wiki. Um, and basically, this is the uh, variable that this gets stored to. This is lambda expression passing in the front view. Um, it uh, aggregates all the posts, gets the count. So now at this point, this numPost variable has the post count. And then we have posts, random delete, post random delete. So at the end of this test, we should have had two of those posts get removed from the list. So at this point, we can verify that exactly two posts were deleted. And then we could pass in our lambda expression, the view, which is still a front view. Um, and numPosts minus two should equal the current count. Um, if we were to run that. And it passed. And um, getting to the delete method itself, um, this is an example of sometimes you do want to only expose specific services to the tester. Um, 
because the implementation is not always simple. Even with this abstract framework, we have to deal with certain interactions um, in the page object level so that when you're writing the test, you, won't, you don't get confused about whether your syntax broke the test or, um, and at that point, you won't be able to read it as well. Um, we want the test as readable as possible. Um, and basically, for this example, I took the current block and we have this drag and drop extension. This returns a um, drag, this returns a drag action, um, which drags one block to a certain offset, for example. Um, so it drags it left 50 pixels. Um, and that will show us the delete, uh, the, yeah, the delete button, um, and then calls a, another extension method, which is an inline web driver wait. Um, so we have a lot of Selenium um, has been added, a layer has been added on a lot of the core Selenium interactions that um, typically in a normal page object framework, it's going to take many lines of code and when you look back at that code, you're not really gonna be sure why you did it or what exactly it does in a lot of cases. Um, so this basically waits until the, um, based on the inspector, waits until that certain element is there um, and then it gets it and clicks delete. Um, so the whole idea is that we're still dealing with core Bumblebee interfaces. Um, everything is I clickable, I select boxes, um, I text fields, and on and on. They're all I blocks, which basically means that Bumblebee is a component, an interface based component library that you can implement however you want. Um, and as long as the tester knows that they're dealing with a Bumblebee extension or Bumblebee itself, they're only gonna be dealing with these interfaces and custom implementations of, um, say that we wanted um, custom clickables, we can return a specified, um, a specified derivation of that element um, and that will be very clear in our page object. And from there, we can even create a component library um, for example, Android has moved to an idea of fragments. Instead of having static views, you're building views based on static implementations, but they could be very dynamic. They could be built of anything. Um, a combination of components. So you can define these components somewhere within your library and just include those components one line and um, the properties are already defined in one place. Um, you don't have to rewrite them ever again. Um, so that's where we are with Bumblebee iOS. Questions, concerns? Why is it called Bumblebee? Uh, so our automation team is uh, oh, oh. referred to as the Autobots. Yeah, we, um, um, we're on a team of automated test developers and for short, our company calls us the Autobots. So um, most of the frameworks that we have released has been some Autobot name we have another framework called Ratchet, one called Sideswipe. This is Bumblebee. Okay. I got one. Uh, you want to go to tests? You want to go to I clickable, for example? No, I think he's talking about. Uh, where's our? The example. Yeah, yeah. Do you mean within an actual test or the uh, implementation? I guess it's used with the Okay. Here, I'll... One sec. Sorry, I definitely introduced that but didn't actually talk about it. Okay. So up here, I have a test case that logs in. And so you go you say their current block were logged out. We go to the login area. We enter our email. This looks pretty much exactly like the iOS test. Uh, here we enter text. This is a valid account. You can go screw with it if you want. Uh, we hit the login button and that's it. We expect this to go to a logged in page here. See how it returns the logged in page. I can take this and do that and that shouldn't uh, as a tester, I know that that should not go to a logged in page. That should go to a logged out page. So all I do is say, this one I expect to go to a logged out page. Done. 
and now it returns me a logged out page object. It's returning, so uh, what we're referring to as a block is essentially a page object, but it could have smaller scope and blocks can be nested within, uh, inside each other. Yeah, it'll work just fine. So, so mm -hmm. uh, the, okay, I'll show you the, uh, the email property itself. So here's the login area, which is a block. And so here we have an iText field and this generic type right here is what happens, like where it goes after you interact with that element. So after you enter text into an iText field, it will return to you one of these. Uh, because when you enter your email, you don't, you're not really changing pages. You're still interacting with the same block. Right. And another thing you can do is if, if you have like an extremely uh, dynamic element, like say this uh, clickable, like maybe it'll go to like any of 20 locations based on a ton of uh, different factors. You can just go ahead and delete this type because this type is the default of where it'll go after you're done interacting with it. So you go ahead and delete that type. And then uh, back in our tests here, now it basically takes away the option of not specifying where you want it to go. So uh, click is no longer an option because there is no default, so you need to specify where you expect it to end up as a tester. We're out of time. So yep. How, how would you deal with the dynamic content? Like, if you enter you know, a certain thing, it would pop up. Uh, sorry, what? So like, if you enter, say, your email, I, I can't think of an example. Uh, like, like if an alert pops up, you could just throw I alert dialog in here. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry, what was that? Uh, the question is, if you were to, um, sorry, if you were to enter text and then another uh, block of fields would appear in the DOM, how would you interact with those next? The answer, uh, sorry, we're, we're almost out of time, but the answer is you would make a block to encapsulate those elements and then you return that block. All right, thanks everyone.